Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to the Museum of Science in Boston. My name is Tim Miller. And I'm here tonight to talk to you about nanotechnology. Now, this is a word that's been very much uh, in the news and the popular media over the last couple of years. If you haven't heard of it yet, you soon will. And what I'd like to try to do tonight uh, is sort of demystify a little bit uh, exactly what uh, this field of science and technology is. Now, we'll start with the word itself. I'm presuming that you know what technology is. You might not know where nano comes from. And nano is actually just one of many uh, prefixes that we use uh, in the scientific notation system. Uh, there are a whole host of them, and shown here are their multiplication or division values uh, on the right-hand side. And nano is just the one down here, 10 to the minus ninth. So a nano something is 10 to the minus ninth of that thing, a billionth uh, of that unit. We get the word nanotechnology from the distance, the nanometer, a distance of one one billionth of a meter. That's a very tiny size scale, about eight atoms lined up end to end, or the width of one strand of DNA. Uh, but you can have a nano anything. You can have a nanosecond, or a nano year, a nanogram, a nanoliter. Uh, any unit, any metric unit, uh, can be multiplied by any one of these multipliers. Uh, nano also, as I'm sure you've noticed, has been appearing more and more in popular culture and in the popular media. Uh, the names of products called nano or marketing materials that are using that phrase or that word uh, are multiplying. And that's also actually not that new. Uh, those of you who are old enough to remember marketing materials from the 70s and 80s will recall that there was a time when lots of different products were referred to as mega or micro. Right? We still refer to uh, processors in computers as the microprocessor or the microchip. Um, and that's, again, a use of this same system. But there is something different and special about the science that we're able to do on the nanometer scale, sometimes called the nanoscale. And the interesting things that we can do there were first articulated by one of America's most famous physicists, a man by the name of Richard Feynman. Now, Feynman was not only a great academic, but also a great educator. And he was widely praised for his ability to speak to the public and to undergraduates about issues in science and technology. And at the very end of the 1950s, he gave what is now a very famous speech to the American Physical Society called There is Plenty of Room at the Bottom. And in that speech, Feynman argued that there were a whole host of fascinating discoveries to be made at the very, very small size scale. Now, at the time, most physicists believed that the most interesting questions in science had already been solved. We'd split the atom and uh, developed the, the transistor for the first time. And most people thought that technology was uh, sort of plateauing. Well, Feynman disagreed. And he argued that by making things very small, that by doing science at a very, very small scale, we could revolutionize a number of things. And in fact, he articulated four specific areas where we might make a big difference. And they were information, imaging, materials, and machinery. Now, at first, Feynman suggested that by miniaturizing the devices we currently make, we could revolutionize the way we make and store information. And it's important to remember that at the time he gave this speech, uh, computing state-of-the-art consisted of machines like this, the Harvard Mark I, that occupied entire rooms and that were less complex than the uh, processors most of us currently have in our wristwatches, and that data was stored almost exclusively in libraries. We printed paper books, we bound them together, we put them on shelves uh, in libraries. And Feynman suggested uh, that we could radically improve our methods of storing information if we could make uh, tiny imprints or impressions on thin metal or plastic disks, which in fact is exactly what we do today. A modern compact disk or a DVD is a thin sheet of polyethylene, which is a type of plastic, that has a series of these grooves cut in a circular pattern around the disk. Some of the grooves are short, those represent a binary zero. Some of them are long, those represent a one. And these are already actually nanoscale features, or close to it. Uh, the length of a groove in a DVD is something like 400 nanometers, 0.4 microns. Uh, and the density of information that you can store on those disks has gotten phenomenally high. The latest generation is called Blu-ray. Uh, and a single Blu-ray disc can store something like the equivalent of the amount of information you would have on an entire floor uh, of one library, which is a phenomenal change. And miniaturization also, obviously, has changed the way we process information, due largely to what I would argue is the most important invention of the 20th century, the field effect transistor. 
Now, the transistor is the basis of computer processing technology and also of computer memory. And it works in a simple way. It controls a flow of electricity from the source to the drain by the application of an electrical voltage to this thing called the gate. It's a switch, basically. But they can be made very, very small. And the reason that computer technology in particular has been progressing so quickly over the last 30 to 40 years, I mean, most of us buy computers for maybe $1,000 or more. We keep them for three to four to five years, and then we throw them out and buy another one uh, because the next generation is so much better than the last. Uh, that's a, a very fast technological change. But it's been enabled almost exclusively by the shrinking of this device. The distance between the source and the drain is getting smaller and smaller with each successive generation of computer processors. The current generation now has that distance at something like 40 to 50 nanometers. We call it the 45 nanometer process. That's the name of the fabrication technology. Uh, and that device has been getting smaller and smaller uh, and enabling computers to be faster and faster and more complex. Now, interestingly enough, this revolution in information that Feynman proposed has largely been achieved. And one of the interesting fields of nanotechnology now is how do we get away from this type of technology? It turns out that as the source and the drain get closer and closer together, you lose the ability to turn the switch on and off with a voltage at the gate. There's a certain distance here, and we're not exactly sure what the distance is, but it's probably on the order of 10 to 15 nanometers at which electrons can simply jump or tunnel from the source to the drain. You can no longer turn the transistor on and off. And because this is a multi-billion dollar industry, obviously there's a lot of interest in finding uh, the next technology or architecture that's going to replace this idea. The second thing Feynman suggested is that we needed a revolution in our ability to image things. Now at the time, the electron microscope was a relatively new idea, and Feynman argued that we needed to make that microscope much, much better. Well, we've not only done that, but we have in the last 20 years created a whole new class of microscopes called the scanning probe microscopes. Now these are microscopes that instead of firing either photons or electrons at a material and looking for their reflection, operate by moving a tip, rostering, over a surface back and forth and sensing the electrical changes, uh, the forces that change as that tip moves back and forth, uh, and then drawing a map of the surface. And those microscopes have enabled us to image things on a very, very small scale with greater resolution than we've ever been able to do before. In fact, they've also allowed us to manipulate things on that scale. Because you're using a physical tip, those microscopes are able not only to take pictures of things on a small scale, but to move them around. This here is a picture of a thing called a quantum corral. These were first built by a man by the name of Don Eigler at IBM. And what he's done here, each of the little spikes that you see represents a single atom. Now he's doing this at a very low temperature, but he's using the tip of his microscope, bringing it down to the surface, and then dragging an atom at a time around the surface. And he was able to arrange them into this ring. The waves that you see in the center are the waves of the electrons interfering uh, with one another. And that's a radical change. These types of microscopes have really enabled us to manipulate things uh, on the fundamental level, one atom at a time. In fact, Feynman actually said in his speech, someday the day may come uh, when we actually can move individual atoms one at a time. We are now at that level. Now, this is not particularly useful for making a device that you might use uh, because it's slow uh, and not a sort of industrial scale process, but we are beginning uh, our ability to move and image things uh, yeah, on a much more sophisticated level than we've ever had before.